Today, we are going to be looking at how to play with gouache in your nature journal. And I think gouache is a really fun, a really useful medium. Um, it's a little bit more persnickety than using straight up watercolor. Um, and if you were in our previous class, you know, we're looking at how, you know, you put it down and it dries. You think, hey, that's cool. What could possibly go wrong? And then you paint over it and all the stuff that you had there before re-wets. And, and it's now blending with all this sort of stuff that you had dried. And so, you know, and um, it also does a lot of this drying shift thing where like if it's a light color, it's going to dry darker. And if it's a dark color, it's going to dry lighter. And <laughs> these, uh, so it, it does some kind of irritating things, but because it can go opaque, that means that if I have a layer of something that I want to hide from you, I can put the, the water, this gouache down and you can't see what's underneath it. So the, the opacity is a really kind of cool trick that it does. And so for a long time, what I did with my own gouaching is that I had in my watercolor kit, and I still have this, um, I have the gouache zone, right? So this is where I, um, I've got you know, sort of some squirts of gouache and I will um, mix these colors with this and to get little you know light greens or light blues and these sorts of things basically anytime that i do i'm using white paper and i want to make something lighter what i usually do is i just add more water to the watercolor and you don't need any gouache because when you put the gouache in with say watercolor it often ends up looking a little bit more dull a little bit more chalky and so um if you can lighten something by um just adding more water into the watercolor mix that generally speaking with watercolors is a great way to go however if you're using toned paper um you're not able to do that because um you go for a really light value light color thing with toned paper the color of the paper is still showing you showing through um i have been i enjoy using toned paper um and uh and so uh, also if you have say some watercolor washes down you put some dark value watercolor on and it's dried and you want light value things on top of that one way to handle that is to put some gouache on top of your dry watercolor not on your wet watercolor put it on wet watercolor and all that color in the wet watercolor will come right through your gouache right right through your gouache and you're like oh <laughs> I just painted you and now I have this weird sort of chalky dark green thing instead of I wanted to have this little white zone on my dark green thing just let it dry but today I want to show you a technique for um, intentionally using other colors of gouache that I find really really useful and in our previous class we made gouache kits and I want to show you mine now that it's dried there it is. If you look at it, there are some cracks in the surface, but a, most of them don't go all the way through and stuff is staying in the palette. Let's see if I can. Yay. All right. So stuff is staying in there. I'm not having that really obnoxious problem of my gouache crumbling into little bitty bits and and dropping all over the page. That's because as these have dried, I've continued pressing them down, squishing them into here and I now have this light value gouache palette. Notice that all the colors on here are light value. So there's no dark blue, there's no dark green, there's no dark anything. It's only light values. So part of what I'm going to be looking at today is that when I am putting dark values down on my paper, I'm using my watercolor because it behaves like watercolor. I'm used to that. I don't have this rewetting problem. I don't have as much of the, I'm not, it's not getting chalky and pasty. Um, it's behaving like cooperative watercolor. So I, where, when I can go dark, I'm going to be using my watercolor and I'm going to then be adding in some gouache. So here is your general rule of thumb. You ready for it? It is your dark values use your watercolor as a transparent medium. 
So you're going to be mixing with water and you've got, you're thinking of your watercolor as transparent watercolor, right? That doesn't mean that you can't kind of build it up to kind of a, a thicker medium, but you, you're sort of, it's the darks, dark value stuff, watercolor, and you're going to sort of handle it just like regular transparent watercolor. Your lights think gouache and opaque. So the dark values, they're all going to be, um, we're kind of handling this with, with, with transparent washes. The light values, we're going to use our gouache as an opaque medium. And let's take a look at how that might look. I'm going to be playing with some sketches of, um, I'm going to be playing with some sketches of warblers today. So these are our wood warblers um, from the United States, um, just because I <laughs> love me some warblers. I love me some warblers. They're just gorgeous little birds. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is I'll be sketching these kind of live in front of you. And for reference material, I brought out a, a, a bird book. So this is, this is the All the Birds book. Um, it's illustrated by a bunch of different people, but the, um, the, the warblers in it are illustrated by the great Lawrence McQueen, Larry McQueen. So Lawrence B. McQueen is one of um, my favorite, he, he's my favorite bird watercolorist. And so I'm... Um, not going to be copying these drawings. I'm going to be actually, I'll sort of, I'll, when I'm uh, drawing um, a warbler on the screen, you'll be able to see this book open. And this is, I'm going to be just using this as reference to make sure I get, you know, like, oh yeah, you've got stripes on your tummy. I'm getting stripes on my tummy. But I'm going to be drawing the birds from a different position than what we're seeing here. So that also kind of give you an insight into kind of how my brain is tickling this information and kind of rotating it around. These, these wonderful, Lawrence B. McQueen um, watercolor illustrations. You know, should you get this this book? This, um, uh, Lawrence McQueen also he, he did. Um, well, you, you can flip through it when you kind of get to the stuff that that he did. You'll know it. Um, the uh, just oh, it's done with just transparent watercolor and it just rocks my socks. Um, so let's let's now draw a one of these warblers and I'll kind of talk you through how I'm taking this little warbler. Oh, the, the, the book title is All the Birds of North America. Everyone. Um, and uh, so what I'm, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to walk you through, kind of talk you through how I'm kind of rotating this bird in three-dimensional space. And uh, here we go. So I'm now going to change cameras. There it is. All right, so here is my book for teaching classes. All right. There we are. All right, let's let's start out with um, so here's some Lawrence McQueen pictures. This is the myrtle myrtle warbler. It's um, one of the forms of the yellow rumped warbler, and it's got this wonderful sort of uh, male has got this slate gray back, bold black patterns on it. Some really nice whites whites in the wing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this bird, the side view of it, and kind of in my head rotate it towards you. So we're looking at it kind of at a front three quarter view, sort of the same sort of position ish that you're seeing here, except mine's going to be mine's going to be rotated a little bit more. And so I am going to um, just kind of keep this off on the side of my um, line of sight just to make sure that you know where there's an eye ring, I'm getting an eye ring. And here's how I would kind of I might kind of go about constructing this. You know, here is a, a, a light ball of the body. And 
a light little um, ball for its head. And so I'll put these down and then I'm looking at sort of the relative positioning of these. I think like, oh no, that head is feeling like way too high up. I want that kind of tucked down a little bit, maybe a little bit larger. So at the start of a drawing, these, these uh, something like this can be very, um, very plastic. It's easy for me to kind of move things around like head positions. Um, tail's going to be sticking off at an angle. <clears throat> On a three-quarter view, a line that's really helpful is the one right down the middle of its throat and onto the belly. So here is the center line of my bird. It's coming down here and the bird's going to be, here's its eye line. So across the head, I'm making these little crosshairs the eye is going to go on this line. The beak is going to be centered on this line. And so there's see that little cross right through the head. All right. Now, um, I'm going to put a little beak on this. When you're drawing a bird in profile, let's say the bird's the same size in profile, it would probably have a beak about like that. But we're drawing it here at this three quarter view, which means that the beak is going to appear shorter. So I'm going to draw this little kind of shorter beak in here. Have a little bit of an angle on this side of the head, flat top and flat around the back end of the head. So on a three quarter view, very often on the side of the face that is um, turned away from you, you see, <clears throat> you see a little bit of dishing. And on the side that is turned towards you, you've got to get a little hint of the roundness of the back of the head. Here's where the back of the body will be. The wing will be tucking into this area here. So it'll be a foreshortened wing. So I'm not going to draw much of the wing. That sometimes is a weird, confusing angle to do. Um, for now, I'm just kind of putting a little placeholder. I just have a little box in here. That's where my wing is going to go. Um, and let's see, so this bird is going to have a, this kind of really cool white throat. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of it's a yellow spot on the side here, a dark vest, some stripes that go down on it. And this bird is going to be hanging out on a branch. And that I, if its body weight is coming down here, I need these feet at least on either side of that kind of where the body weight comes down and then my branch will be in here. So there's some sort of just sort of initial lines blocking this in. That's enough information for me to now start to draw on top of this. So I'm gonna now just, this is a 0.5 millimeter pencil. It's got 2B lead in it. And um, I'm going to be drawing my bird with this. So I'm gonna just, start here with kind of reinforcing that beak, a little kind of line out at the corner. Let's zoom down on that a little bit more. There it is. Right. And um, so this bird's eye is going to be somewhere in this area. So I'm just sort of making a little angry bird's mark here, sort of where the lores are. Want to kind of get this relationship between the eye and the beak, that distance is going to be important for me. And this area between those two called the lores, I think it's, you want to sort of pay attention to, pay attention to that. All right. Now, um, this bird has a dark cheek patch or auricular patch. And the one on the other side is wrapping around the other side of the face. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw in a little bit of kind of dark, the little tiny triangle out here where that big triangle is now wrapped around the side of the face. This side of the forehead is steeper, flat across the top, and then rounded on the other side. Lawrence McQueen shows me that, look, it's got this cool little 
uh, a stripe above the eye, crescent below the eye. And this is, this is actually one of the really good characteristics to tell the difference between the um, Myrtle form and the Audubon's form of the yellow rump warbler. Do you see the way that this white here hooks up? It really hooks up <clears throat> underneath um, this, this dark ear patch. On a, um, I'm gonna just fast forward here to where the other kind of color form of this is. Um, notice that on the um, Audubon's form, you don't get that. <clears throat> so even on an immature, you kind of get this kind of more crisp throat zone here. And on the Myrtle, this it really kind of tucks in underneath there. And so that's, that's, that's kind of a, that's a cool point for this bird. So there's going to be white that comes down there. There's your little throat. Um, there is a some white up here above its eye. And there's also a yellow stripe that goes right down the middle of the head. And fortunately, I have this little kind of indication of a little line right here. See that? <laughs> That is where the middle line of my head is. And so I'm gonna put in a little uh, lopsided V there. So I'm not making this V, if this is the top, I'm not making it symmetrical like that as if it's pointing straight towards me. Because if the head is pointing off to my right, then what I'm gonna get is the right side of that is gonna be straighter, the left side of it is gonna be longer. So a little lopsided V on my forehead. Um, so I'm going to have my wing kind of tucking in here. There's going to, I'm going to see part of my wing, some of these covert feathers in this area. So sort of lesser and greater covert feathers. And most of this wing is going to be foreshortened away from me. Because the wing kind of wraps around the body a little bit, I'm going to be seeing more. I'm not going to be seeing even amounts of all these different parts of the wing. I'm going to be seeing more of that part that's closer to me. And then this little cute tail is going to be sticking out here. And that's drawing some of the body. So I'm going to have a slight angle change here, right in here where the head meets this body. Let me get a little hint of these sort of division between these two lumps of the breast feathers in here. Um, a little hint of some shagginess on this back edge here, a little bit smoother around here. Here we might be kind of getting into the lower flank feathers get a little bit more shaggy. So there might be a little hint of some shag down there. And then um, my toes are going to be wrapping around this branch. I'm going to have this toe kind of up higher and on its own. And the back toe is kind of curved around there. A um, little cone here on the top of the foot. This, so some toes sort of sticking in here. And the back toe, I'm going to show that just, you know, arr, big, big back claw sticking down there. And that's a little bit overdone. That's a little bit subtler. So this bird has, has a uh, dark on its chest. And so that's going to come to kind of a a, a point up here, it's roughly going to be kind of going down on both sides and it's going to get streaky. So there's going to be kind of a streak of that in here, a streak of that in here. And then in this area here, there's going to be a yellow spot on the side of the bird. So that's, that's some kind of uh, quick, um, yeah, I want this to, um, here we go. Um, so there, there's, there's my initial sketch. Now I'm going to draw some gouache on this bad boy. And I'm going to start with my watercolor. I'm going to start with watercolor. And I'm going to be using my watercolor transparently. Um, so 
when I first open up my water brush, sometimes there's a little bit too much water on the tip of it. So I often just give that a few initial wipes on, on a rag. And I am going to rise up so you can watch me mix paint here a little bit. Um, I want kind of a bluish gray. So I'm going to get some bluish gray, a little bit more bluish. And I don't know what color that's really going to look like on this tone paper until I test it out there on the tone paper. Yeah, and it turned out to be a little bit bluish gray. So that worked for me. Um, and so notice how my pencil, my, my, my brush tip is kind of broad here. I'm going to put it back in the palette and spin it just a little bit. And now I've got a sharp tip. Here. Now there's white and dark marks in this wing here. If I were doing the normal painting on white paper, I would leave those whites, but I don't have to be that careful about it right now because I've got my friend gouache. So I just made that whole dark, kind of this dark that whole wing, a dark gray mass. Now, <clears throat> um, sort of following the general watercolor principle of start light uh, value and work your way darker, I'm going to do that. Um, so now I'm going to get into some of these dark areas on this bird. Some people don't like to have black on their palette. I find it's very, very convenient. If you want to, you can have that's neutral tint. Right? That's what I use for my black. And so does, of all people, Lawrence B. McQueen. Shout out. All right. Um, and uh, he also uses neutral tint. Um, so I now have some kind of dark black on my paper, on my brush tip. And I am going to come in here, and here is my lores area. Here is my eye, and I might leave just a little bit of, uh, no, I think I'm gonna make my, that eye all dark. There is a crescent of light underneath the eye, and so I could work around that. I could also just go over it and add it entirely with gouache later. Um, so if I made a mistake and, you know, covered that up, it would not be that bad a thing. Because I've got gouache working for me. So there's the um, eye patch on one side, ear, eye patch, ear patch. The one on the other. And for my beak, I'm going to just use my this brush tip, just like a pencil. If you look, I can draw very fine lines. And I'm going to put a little line over the top, a little line where that kind of corner of the mouth is, but not really bring it all the way to the tip. And then I'm going to kind of fill underneath that. And I get the sort of the zone where perhaps, um, light might be reflecting on the top of that bell. Um, now I've got this um, wonderful vest here. And there is a Sort of a broad zone across the top here. And I'm going to have a stripe that is coming down here. There's going to be another stripe that is going to be coming down in this area. And the one on the other side is sort of wrapped around the other side of the bird. So those stripes, again, we've got stripes on the side of the bird. But because I'm looking at it from the front, I'm not showing you it on the side that's wrapped away from us. And we see a few of these, uh, just two of these here on this side of the bird. Ooh. 
I'm putting some tone into those legs. I'm also going to put a little bit of um, darkness into the head and back and wings. So there's here I'm essentially drawing with the tip of my brush, kind of suggesting that these are feathers coming up over our little bird's forehead. And <clears throat> And on its back here, I'm getting kind of a variable line by, by having different amounts of pressure. You see how I'm kind of I'm lifting, when I kind of lift my brush tip on and off here, I can get marks that are sometimes thicker, sometimes thinner, gives me just a little bit of irregularity in those marks. And then the wing is going to be in this area here. There is <clears throat> going to be an, an area of covert feathers. And then the secondary feathers will be out behind this. And I went a little, sloshed a little bit too much into what I wanted to be a wing bar, but that's okay. Now, this bird is ready for, so this is just like I would do with a normal, um, a normal uh, watercolor. <clears throat> I'm going from light value to darker. Now, the fun gouache part. So I'm going to clean my brush off and with the water brushes, I just give it a squeeze and a wipe on the rag. And look at that, the brush is clean. So that's not paint going down there. That's just some clean water. And I'm gonna switch palettes. I am going to start with some of the white in here. So on this, I, for mixing white with other colors, I've got these little globs of white in here. But for this, because it'll be just straight up white feathers, I'm going to go into this. So I don't want too much water on my brush. So I'm going to just kind of dry my brush slightly. And watch this. I'm going to put my brush tip in here and I'm taking it for a wiggly spin. What I'm doing is I'm taking this dry gouache and I'm mixing it up into a little bit of a paste here in front of me. So I'm changing its texture from transparent to more opaque. And when I get this into a paste, you're gonna see that I'm going to be able to draw, um, you know, bright white areas on top of my little bird here. So let's, here is, get my, There's that little crescent under the eye. I'm going to give it a little highlight in that eye. Maybe even a highlight on part of the beak. Without it getting too wet, I am Here's a little bit of white above its eye. And then on the far side of that, a bigger piece. And I can kind of let the, 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 the ends of this, sort of these little kind of these, these, these rougher brush strokes, I can let some of the, the texture of these brush strokes kind of show. And that will feel kind of feathery. I'm gonna do the same thing down here on the throat. So this bird's malar zone is right in here. So this bird has a white malar. Malar is the, the part that is below your, um, your ear patch, your auricular. And then that's swinging up in here. And watch this, this, this kind of little bit of texture. See that? That just gives you this sort of sense like, oh, we just got a little bit fluffy. Mm 
Here's my throat. And I might leave just a little bit of some paper showing through right on the edge of that um, malar zone. So that this little line here, there we go. You see how that kind of just looks, it looks feathery, it looks fluffy. Now <clears throat> I'm gonna do the same on the chest. If my sunlight's coming from this direction, it's gonna be making this area brighter. This area over here is gonna be more in shade and shadow. So I'm while the paint is thicker on my brush, I'm gonna do those areas that are a little bit more prominent in the um, sunlight first. I'm leading those areas that as, as, as I start to paint more, my brush is going to run more and more out of paint. I could recharge it, and then I get bright white lines. But I'm actually going to kind of take advantage of the fact that it's a water brush, and so it progressively runs out of paint. So do you see I'm get, you're kind of getting a sense that this is fluffy stuff? Coming down here, I am going to need to add a little bit more paint. There we are. And look at this. This is this is going to be really fun. I'm going to come up here into this little white stripe on the belly here. And um, as I do that, you know, here, what I'm doing is I'm essentially painting white on top of the dark. this gouache to be a little bit more bright. So that makes that edge a little bit more irregular. And as we kind of get down towards this area here, I'm going to just wipe off a little bit of the paint on the tip of my brush. I want a little hint, watch this. I'm gonna put down some white in here and it's gonna feel it's white on the bottom, but just wait for a second, wait for a second, wait for a second, wait for it. As it dries, there's the drying shift. You see that shadow coming back in on the belly? All right, so that's, I put down a light value thing and now it's getting darker. So you see this, this, this shadow coming back in there. I actually just used some gouache here as more of a transparent thing instead of as thick, I put a very kind of transparent wash. It gives you a little hint that there's some white down there. And then the drying shift happens. And that shadow, which originally was obliterated, comes back. Now, I'm going to clean my brush off and I'm going to jump over to, this is the part I've been waiting for. I mean, getting to paint bright yellow on this toned paper and have it come out bright is just fun. So see, again, I'm mixing this into a thick paste. Thick paste, there it is. And keeping that same shape of that triangle spot, that's what I'm going to paint in up here right on top of this birdie's head. Jack, I have a question. For those who don't have all the colors of the gouache, is it possible, like last week, we can lay down the white gouache, let it dry, and then add transparent yellow over it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me just do a little demonstration with that. You see right over here is that little spot of yellow, right? I mean, a spot of white on my palette. I'm just going to get some regular watercolor, and I can then come in here and tint that yellow. Or if I want it to be a darker shade of yellow, pick a darker shade of yellow. So that allows me to get that bright on top of my paper. If I just have, that's a really good question. Um, yellow rump warblers, they've got five spots of yellow on their little warbly bodies. So they have one on the top of their head. They have one on either shoulder. Um, they have, um, 
um, on the Audubons, you'll get a spot of yellow on the throat. And then there's a little bit on the top of the, the, the rump. So up in that area. Um, so this one uh, being the, the myrtle form, it's not gonna have the yellow in here, um, but I'm gonna get this little sort of shoulder patch. So mixing up thick yellow again, I want it, I'm, I want it to be an opaque paste. Here it is. And I'm gonna test that over here. So I need that to be a little bit, um, kind of getting the, the, the texture of this paint. That's the kind of the, the challenge. I don't want it too watery, otherwise it's transparent. And you get more of that drying shift. If it's too thick though, it doesn't paint nicely. It doesn't flow off your brush. There we go. All right, so now up in here. I've got my little yellow spot. I'm also going to throw in a little yellow spot, a hint of that, just seen over the wing there. Now, cleaning my brush. As a final little thing in here, I'm going to go back to some, um, to my black, to my neutral tint here. And test that, All right? That's not really flowing very well, which means I've got, I need to add a little bit more water to it. And so sort of smearing it around in here. Let's see how that flows. Okay, now, now it's flowing a little bit better. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to just add a few, oh, I forgot the whites in the wing over here. Ah, I've got my brush all charged up with dark as my last thing. Let, let, let's kind of keep with, I'm, I'm gonna get rid of all that nice black that I made just to kind of keep kind of clear order of operations. Um, I'm going to give our friend the bird here um, some wing bars. So here's my white paste. Test this off on the side. And so the, the edges of the greater coverts on these birds have, they have, um, white tips on them. And the leading edges of some of those feathers also have white on them. And <clears throat> so now, I can wipe that all off, clean this. And I'm going back, picking up that black that I mixed earlier, the neutral tint, testing it before it hits the page and it's good. And here's uh, what I'm gonna do. I'm going to just come along and see if there's a few kind of darks that I can punch on this. So I put in a little bit more dark by its eye I'm going to put a little bit of dark around the bottom edge of this crescent, maybe into the lures here. That um, kind of really helps with your bird's expression. I really like some a little bit of punch in the lures these days. I'm going to put a hint of some texture into this ear patch. Uh, hard to see on your screen. Um, also, this wonderful black bar across the um, the chest. Um, I want to make that look a little bit more feathery. And remember how before I was putting the white on the black, now I'm going to think of kind of going the opposite direction. So part of it is made by putting white on black, but part of it is made by putting black on white.
And I think I want to just a little bit more, uh, maybe not. I'm going to have a slightly more contrast on these little spots on the back. Some of these spots right up in here, right in here in the middle of the face. A few dark accents in the wing. I like the way this critter is turning out. I, bird sort of feels like it's got a little bit of attitude kind of looking back at me. I'm gonna add some highlights here on the feet, maybe where some of these kind of scaly toes might hit, uh, get hit by light. And you often see these birds in the woodlands. So um, actually before I do that, this throat is feeling a little bit too monolithically white. I like some of the variation that I'm getting down here in the chest. So that's neat about water uh, gouache is because it can re-wet. What I'm gonna do is just take a, a clean brush. I'm gonna lift a little bit of the paint out of this side of the throat, just to put a little bit of shadow into that side of the face. There you see a little bit of the paper poking through. There we go. And now, because this is a dark color, I'm just going to go with straight watercolor. This is perylene green that I'm dropping in here, which is a dark green that is so dark. Well, look at this. To make this edge feel fluffy, watch what I do. As I make these little brush strokes in here, we'll get down closer on this. I want this edge to feel fluffy. So I've got my brush charged up. I'm just kind of coming in with some strokes like this. Oops, we're not on the screen at all. <laughs> strokes like that. And then you kind of come along the edge and then that feels like, oh, there's some fluff in there. So I'm just taking the tip of that and kind of poking it into there a little bit to give me a little bit of... Uh, this tail here is disappearing into, it's a little bit too close in value. So I'm going to just darken it right in here. Again, this is still, it looks like I'm putting black on. That's actually just watercolor perylene green. And then that tail pops out a little bit more. I'm going to bring that dark around this other side of the bird. I've turned my piece of paper at a different angle just because <clears throat> this makes for an easier drawing angle for me. So put your um, your your piece of paper at whatever angle is going to be convenient for you. And right in here, see how this is a dark strip? It's a dark strip up there. Um, watch what I'm going to do with my bird color. I mean, my background color. Look at that. Why is it 
that I left the paper here lighter right at this spot here. Hmm. So that was on purpose. A little bit of dark now between the legs here. So right where it's really bright chest, I can put in darker, darker values. And that dark right next to the belly of the bird really pops that white chest. So here again, really dark values with my paraline green. But where the bird is dark, I've actually let the paper be a little bit lighter. Looking over the whole bird, I think I'm wanting a little, I think I might be able to see a little bit of the white that would be in that area. So I'm just gonna go back to my gouache, mix up some opaque. Uh, I need to make sure my texture is right. Little hint of that. There's a a little bit of a foreshortened uh, myrtle form of the warbler done with this sort of mixed media technique. So for the, the light values, I'm putting in the gouache in an opaque way. I think I want to punch this up a little bit more with some opaque gouache in here. <clears throat> um, and for the dark parts, I'm just using my, uh, my watercolor as I normally do. That's transparent watercolor. And uh, even with transparent watercolor, you can still get really deep values. That's my, that's my system for creating with this, with this medium. I find it, oh, one more thing. Throw, I always tend to overwork things at the end. Maybe I'm deep into that part now. I'm going to test just to make sure that I know. See that little line I just made really thick? I'm glad I tested it on my paper. That meant that I've got more water on my brush than I thought I had. I thought that I was going to be able to make a thin, crisp little line. So let's try that again. There, yeah, that's better. Dropped a little detail into the tail. So there's a little, there's our front. There it is for scale. Let's, um, here was my reference material from the wonderful Lawrence B. McQueen. Um, and that was fun. Um, the the, the light value is opaque. Remember that you can lift it out if you want to bring the shadows back into something. You're sometimes drawing the white. So look at the texture around here. We're drawing those whites on. And you're sometimes drawing the darks with the tip of your brush. Um, maybe I want the chest of this to be a little bit brighter. So I'm just gonna mix up some thick gouache again. And I might actually fray the tip of this. Yeah, 
นะสมมติว่าที่นี่ว่าคุณคิดกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับกับ What I'm going to do is I'm just going to lightly kiss the edges of this bird in here. When I first put it down, it's going to be more in my face, more opaque. But as that dries, because it's more transparent. Um, uh, it's it's going to, to to lighten, and that just is going to Pull that edge of the bird towards me just a little bit. There, that was fun. I hope that that was helpful for you. Um, let's now just sort of drop into some. Some some questions and answer, answers and a discussion about using um, this. Um, see if anybody has any direct questions about this technique. Um, and I'm going to start with my friend Jack. Um, so I just had a question about uh, shadows. Um, I know that when you're using watercolor, you know you do this thing where you you have this uh, shadow violet that you drop in. Um, what about If you're drawing on toned paper and you have a drawing with, you know, a lot of transparent watercolor, some like white gouache parts, what do you do about shadow violet? And because I know that like with gouache, you can like lift, you know, lift some some of the paint out or let some of the paper show through from shadows. So like, how, what do you do when you like get that mixture of the different the different mediums? Let, let's say something. Uh, so it's. You know, with with the gouache, you can always on the tone. If it's gray toned paper, especially, you can come through and just with a damp brush lift out some of your colors in those shadow zones. Um, it's also there's no problem with getting some shadow violet in there, so that there are actually are some darks in there that are even a little bit darker. And then you can put your once that's dry, you can be putting your gouache over it, and that'll be mostly obscured by your 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 gouache. You know, think of the. Um, you can think of that shadow violet um, once it's dry, being just like maybe you know even slightly darker toned paper back then, and then you can drop those 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 highlights in on top of it, or the light value things on top of it with your gouache mixed to a kind of a a point of opaque thickness. So you would, you would put. Uh, the shadow violet in as if it was white paper, and then you can just sort of manipulate the gouache to, you know, either go around it or be more transparent over it. Um, so let's say I've got, you know, the belly of the beast down here. All right. So here's here's some some bird, and it's got it's got some little belly. If I lead with some shadow violet, so here's some shadow violet. That's going to be way too dark. That's a little bit better, right? And so I've got some of that um, on the belly of my bird, and then this bird is going to have. Uh, it's going to be looking towards me. Its wings going to be over here. Um, so I've got this sort of dark smudge in the middle of my birdie, um, <clears throat> and this is a uh, 
little scrub jay with its Uh, it's that little kind of dark necklace thing that they have going. Um, and I'm now going to put gouache on top of it. As I come in here, You know, that shadow zone can show through a little bit. And I can still follow my, 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 my basic same approach. And I do this if I want there to be kind of darker accents in some of those, those shadow zones. I can also then come back on this and lift out. So here's a damp brush, and I just lifted a bunch of that out, and that shadow zone then became a lot darker, right? Did that answer the question? Um, yeah, I was. Yeah, that's that's interesting. How you? I mean, that that's kind of what I've been doing too, because I've been trying to figure figure it out. Um, I was also talking about, you know, kind of, I guess what I do when I'm, when I'm, when I have like a watercolor dark part that's in shadow, and then I have a, like what, like gouache, I guess a part that I would use gouache to paint that that's also in shadow. I was just painting, the, I was just doing the shadow violet over everything. And then, you know, leaving, leaving some of the gouache out as you just, as you just showed. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's helpful. So, thank you. Yeah. What what I what I don't rec recommend is having this on and then mixing up some shadow violet. Um, because if I come over this now with the shadow violet, um, it's going to have more unpredictable effects. Mm -hmm. Where it's now kind of it's now lifting, it's now rewetting some of the gouache, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's going to get more confusing in there. I think it's easier to have um, not put that light wash over that wash. Um, I guess I could do this, then let that dry, and then retexture it. But um, yeah, paint the, the the light paint kind of over that wash. It'll react differently on the paint than it does on the wash, and it can make for some kind of confusing and inconsistent effects. Excellent, thank you. Great, thanks for the question, Jack. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna jump over to Sandra, uh, who's also got uh, another question about this approach. Hi there, Sandra, it's great to see you. Oh, you're currently muted. You are currently... How's that? Perfect. Um, I have a simple question. Why did I rush to buy two tubes of gray gouache? Gray oh. number one and number two. Uh, and they're, like, they're very, very similar to each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what I have found is that um, I reach for those grays a ton. Did we use it today? Have I used it today? Um, no, I didn't. No, I did not use That's, it at all today. There was um, my question. But actually, actually, let's let let me let me um, uh, do something, and um, I'll show you kind of with the gray number with the gray number one, the lighter value one. Um, that um, is 
um, just it, it's a it's a very nice kind of mousy gray that um, you know can go into you know cloudscapes. It can go into all sorts of other things. Oh, that, we, we, actually, we should do a little landscape with this approach. That would be kind of another fun thing to do. Just so we're not kind of like all up in the business of a little feathery bird, we need to kind of look at some a sort of like a sky um, with this. But I find myself using that kind of light number one um, a, a, a lot of places. It's a very sort of subtle pale. And for my, when it, I get darker, much darker than that, I'm probably going to be wanting to reach for watercolor anyway. Um, the number two, the gray number two, has this incredible magic trick that it does. Check. This out. Yeah, you told us that. Oh, I already told you. I, spoiler alert, right? Yeah, so, same color as your page. That's right. So it is very close to the value of Strathmore gray paper. Mm -hmm. um, so when I, um, for people who weren't here when we, oops, sorry, weren't here when we kind of demonstrated this. Um, let's say um, there are, you know, there's some marks or things that you don't want to have on your paper. Um, what I can do then is just mix up a little bit of kind of a thicker mixture of this gray number two, and I paint over that. And it does a really good job of being masking fluid. Um, as it dries, it gets slightly darker. So you'll see that when I first put it on, it's invisible. And then it starts to appear a little bit. But it's close enough that it um, allows me to do lots of, um, lots of uh, corrections on toned gray paper. There it is mixed with a little bit of white. When that dries, it should darken a little bit. We'll see how well it does. So um, I really like it because I make mistakes and sometimes I wanna cover those up. A lot of times I actually really love to have all my mistakes showing through because um, it just reveals my process. Um, I'm on uh, brown. Yeah, on brown toned paper, I haven't, um, it would be nice if I had um, a, um, a color that was this in here, that was the exact same color as the toned paper in my little journal. At this point, I haven't found that yet. Okay, but I I'll find, work on that. Yeah, I, I, I find myself, um, this one is just this very, very light kind of very pale gray that um, still shows up opaque on, on, on uh, uh, lighter than this, this, this paper here. If I'm using it on, um, you know, here's, Here's a little piece of just white paper. It's this, this very useful, soft, mousy gray. You know, what is that? That's, you know, that's, that's, that's part of a mushroom. That's the under fur of a mouse. That's the belly of a sparrow. Um, it's just those sort of off, kind of slightly warm gray colors. I find myself using that a lot. Similarly, I find myself using a little buff titanium in my palette all the time. That's just these really kind of pale, just sort of slightly off weird colors. I find I reach for them a ton. Um, I think another time would be fun for us to do uh, just a little uh, a landscape study with these. And you'll see that these, um, you know, just being able to 
let me kind of go to some of these greens. If I've got a dark in here like this, you know, being able to kind of go like this um, and have that suggest, you know, some 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 greens in the 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 background and be able to put opaque on top of this. I'll actually mix this into a little bit more of an opaque so it doesn't turn away. And then you've got these sunlit leaves against that dark surface. You know, this, this just allows me such an ability to uh, <clears throat> be able to do light on dark, which once you kind of uh, get your um, watercolor down uh, is normally a difficult thing to do. Good trick. Thank you for the question, Sandra. So uh, right now I am in Denmark uh, for a windsurfing competition here, but we live uh, we live on the Denmark west coast, and uh, here around the town that we live is uh, Denmark's biggest and oldest national park. And uh, it's called the Thi, uh, it's called Thi National Park. And uh, it's huge. And I was a couple of days ago, yesterday actually, I was in the tourist information center of uh, like the visitor center of the park. And there was this great book about uh, 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 Kunster, that means uh, art in uh, the National Park, and it's uh, it's uh, a wonderful book. And I just wanted to do a quick flip through because it's probably only available in the visitor park, just to show some of the paintings that are here. So some watercolor landscapes. There's a bunch of different artists here that yeah. have uh, done this and is just all put together in uh, one book. Oh, check that so, boulder out. That oh, oh, with the, the, the sunlit grassland behind it. Oh, that is cool. Check out what that person did on the texture of the grass and foliage in the foreground. I wonder if there's some sort of a resist that was used there. Like the crayon. That I'm not sure. It says, yeah, aquarel. It this is all this is done by a uh, watercolor. Oh, so, that's uh, cool. So mad point props to whoever painted. Jens uh, Jens Overgaard Christensen. Jens Over like Overgaard Christensen was uh, his name. So uh, also some more watercolors. This is a very Nice one. So just a lot of water looks like is used and ju then just some texture brought up by uh, kind of putting darker values like uh, to suggest that there's uh, grassy fields. And, and also just look at the both the contrast and the detail. So the foreground gets more contrast and detail. And watch in this painting as you go into the background, you get less and less detail. That does a great job of conveying uh, the distance. If the artist had fallen for the temptation of drawing lots of little detailed grasses and rocks and boulders into the background, that would really flatten that picture out. That was cool. So a lot of things, also some bit of like a journal style landscape and a bit of a bird uh, in the corner so yes. something like this oh, what are the names of those artists that you're seeing there so uh this this painting is niels peter and and andreasen and this one is this one is my favorite artist in the book it's peter christensen peter christensen peter christensen, peter christensen. Christensen, and you're gonna see some more Reese paintings. So this is also of the cranes that uh, 
uh, nest here also in the park. Beautiful drawing on this also landscape with the with the, with the shrike there that also reminds me of, of your work. Yeah. Yeah. Your shrike day. Oh, this is yeah. Really cool. So also, and there's different techniques. There's a, a watercolor. Then there's a, there was also a, a aquarel. I don't know. No, uh, what was it called? Some some the uh, I don't remember. Sorry, but uh, there's a lot of techniques here. Also some like kind of uh, not just paintings, but also some of these uh, sketches. There are. Kind of oh, that is multiple. so much fun. I love that short-eared owl. Yeah, the... Whenever you find a book like this, just grab it and study it deeply. And it's going to just give you all these ideas of how to approach different subjects and, and, and effects. Yeah. Oh, nice job so... on the contrast with that curlew there. Yeah, this one's beautiful. Really, uh, kind of show well, the habitat. Turn you up for a second because there's something that everybody ought to see here. Remember, we talked this about one? dark. Yeah, dark against yeah. light and light against dark. Look at this. Look at the belly of the bird. Punched in the dark on the belly against the light of the water. Then look at the head of the bird. It's light against. Oh my goodness! Against the dark of that bank there. So that light against dark and dark against light, um, you'll see this strategy again and again, very effective for um, having your, your drawing really pop and read. I also love the effect of that little line of light along the edge of the water on the far bank. You see between the reflection and the shore itself, that little line of of, of, of white in there, just um, really helps that read. That's cool. It kind of divides the two. Yeah. Because if it if it won't have the white line, it kind of would look like there's still some, like this is not a reflection, it's on shore, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, some more sketches the landscapes that are here and uh, some other techniques which i cannot it says lit lit lithography which i don't know what it is and uh but these are some interesting different uh, techniques this is really fun to see Hello everyone. Uh, gouache is one of my favorite mediums and I thought that, and I use it quite a bit. And so I thought I would share how you can um, correct uh, what could be um, dramatic mistakes. I started my sketch on a Strathmore mixed media, white. And then when we got to the white, I thought, well, this isn't gonna work too well. So I had to rush and go grab another Strathmore book that was toned, uh, toned gray. Mm -hmm. And in the process of rushing to get this one drawn, I put the legs initially in the wrong place. They were like right stuck in the middle. So I just went with your par paraline green, washed mm -hmm. those legs right out, and then put new ones in with the gouache, which is just, the, and, and it's not even solid gouache. It's using your, uh, your uh, neutral, um, your neutral gray color plus uh, white. So I put the legs right back in in the right spot. Yeah, it it is it it allow being able to kind of draw on with opaque paint just opens up all sorts of possibilities, doesn't it? It's the most forgiving. It's really forgiving. I've been working a lot with watercolor lately, um, and and it's quite it's quite a shift. Uh, when I make a mistake with watercolor, there's not a lot I can do except try to incorporate it <laughs> into the drawing. Mm -hmm. But with gouache, you know, I have a lot of leeway. Yeah. 
but I thought I'd just share, you can really with the gouache, it's just a wonderful medium and you can do a lot with it. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and it, it's really neat to see you know, that. So legs in the wrong, pro, wrong place, watercolor, um, what are you gonna do about it? Well, you're going to just the next time around, uh, hope that it comes out better. Um, but with, with the gouache on hand, you can um, you can you can put in a whole different pair of legs. I'm going to just get dark green over my the the foliage back there. Let's pop in a totally different pair of legs. I I, I absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing both of those drawings. Um, hi there, Jack. Um, good to see you. So we now have three jacks in our uh, workshops now. It's going to get confusing. Um, two of us, and well, there's, there's another jack now present. How have you been? Good. So two of our butterflies emerged from their chrysalis. And as soon, like a few hours after the first one emerged, I did a, a nature journal on that one. Oh, this is really fun. And that, yeah, that interesting um, pattern on the underside of the wings, that dark margin with those little, those little spots. Yeah, th this one, I think the two emerged yesterday and one was a boy and one was a girl. The girl emerged first, so I think this one is the female. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, I guess it's, it's the, the males that have that big scent gland in their hind wing, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And the really, it, the easiest way to tell for a monarch butterfly, if it's a boy or girl, is the females do not have this, but the males do. If they open their wings near the bottom on one of their black lines on their wings, there is a black dot, two yeah. black dots, one, one on each side. And that means it's a male. If it doesn't have that, that's a female. And we tag them with these monarch tags. My mom is part of this like monarch group. And we get these stickers every year for the butterflies. And we just like carefully, there's like a certain way to put it on. You put it on to a certain gland and the sticker will stay on there. And then if somebody else, in another state as it works its way down to Mexico. If somebody else sees it, they can look at the number on the tag and they can tape it in and you can see and take a picture and you can see where your butterfly has been and if it made it or not. Oh, that is spectacular. That is fantastic. I'm really glad you're, you're doing that. Um, and did, so did you also write into your journal the number for your butterfly? Um, no, I didn't do that, but the black caterpillar, he's still a caterpillar. He hasn't um, done anything yet. He's just eating and eating and eating. Um, we, my mom on the Monarch group five years ago, somebody posted a picture of a few multiple pictures of a black caterpillar, just like ours. It looked just like our same exact black, same, same everything. And it, it had crystallized. And I wonder what came out. <clears throat> yeah, I, they didn't post pictures of what came out. But yeah, so um, I have hope that it might crystallize. And this is, this is going to be really cool. Yeah, document yeah. this process. Document this process. You've got a rare phenomenon here, Jack. And we want to document it and sort of see what, 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 what happens and then what happens. Um, that is, that's really exciting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and when you get some sketches of the 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 the, the black caterpillar, um, we'd love to see that. Um, how, is it growing larger than a lot of the others? Um. Yeah, and it's definitely growing. It's growing larger, but it grows slower than the others. The others just rapidly grow, 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 grow. This one slowly grows but like it doesn't stop growing. Interesting. Oh, this is going to be fun. 
Well, we'll we're going to be we're going to be following your adventures with this critter. Hi, um, I I was doing pencil miles with Ivea, and an hour uh, before you started uh, was the first time I found out that you were doing a session on gouache, which I'm so very thankful for. And um, I had um, September fifth done my first uh, gouache. Um, painting of a cricket. I, I had uh, intended to do this um, when they started chirping on um, August the 9th, but I hadn't received my gouache paints yet. <laughs> I, li I live in a remote area and it took a long time to um, select them and get them since we did the Wild Wonder Conference. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the whole page and it's um, there's the page upright, but I was just trying to zero in on the gouache, yeah. which was really easy to paint the highlights and the other markings and everything. And I really enjoyed using the gouache and I'm looking forward to doing more. And I'm really thankful for a lot of your hot tips today. Oh, great. I'm glad that that was useful to you. Um, yeah, yeah, highlights on things with gouache is so much more intuitive than with watercolor. With watercolor, I'm going to paint dark where the light isn't. Um, with your gouache, your your brush tip is sunlight. Well, and I just went with the whole all of the black and a little gray on the back. I, I, I which was just thinner paint actually, um, and let the white show through. And this is my, you know what journal? Oh, nice little but, journal. Yeah, it's an awesome journal. I wish I got to do it more. I, I'm, I'm not um, able to do it every day like a lot of people, which makes me envious, of course. But I mean, it took me a month to be able to do the cricket. I started hearing them in August. And um, I know that that's always the sign of summer is waning and um, fall is coming when you start hearing the crickets. And uh, I actually did a bunch of research on crickets, but I didn't. Um, I didn't put it all in on the page, uh, but just for my own information, uh, you know, about that they they're born in the spring and by August they're mature and they're ready to mate. And that's why they chirp. It's their mating call. And and uh, um, and then like lately, it's I, I barely hear a chirp like today. I, I don't hear any chirping. So um, they're done doing what they got to do. And. I'll hear them again next year, I guess. Yeah, I mean, what, and um, that would be a, a really interesting phonology phenomenon to follow. Like, when do you start hearing your your cricket chirps? When do they die? And then comparing that year to year. That would well, be- Well, I, I did write down the date, was um, August 9th, was the first chirp I heard, but I live in town. It, um, there might've been earlier out in the country, I don't know. Yeah, you yeah. know, but from where I am, I'm, I will, I will uh, write it, I will date it every year for sure. That's great. Yeah, and for with the drawing highlights with gouache, yeah, you just get to come in there with your white gouache. And that's where I was first introduced to gouache uh, was by a medical illustrator. And she would do these watercolor paintings of like the bodies opened up with all the organs. And then they would look flat and then she would mix up um a little tube actually she carried with her just a little tube of wet gouache in the tube and she would just open this up and dip her brush in it and it's like now time to make it wet and then she'd just come along and put in highlights 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 through it the whole thing and it go from looking matte to all of a sudden bam it's looking wet yeah and, uh that was just that was a tube of white permanent white gouache yeah. Well, she wanted she wanted the thick the thicker layer, you know, right. which um, when you were had your brush in there, you had to work up the thick layer because your paint was already dry. If you mm -hmm. take it right out of the tube, you get it thick right away. Um, but that's not always possible. Well, you're not going to carry a bunch of tubes. But I did find a little palette that's about this big um, with sections in it, and it's got a sealable lid that seals every section. So I squirted a part of a tube in each one of those and then just open it up 
Is that something you'd like to see? I would love to see that. Okay, just to stop. So this is kind of a cool system. So I got this from um, an art supply place in Vancouver called Opus Framing and Art Supplies and that undoes and then this part comes out and this is your water dish and it's got, um, you know, place for brushes. And it, of course it's collapsible, which makes it practical. But this is what can hold your paint and um, it just snaps open. And this is the water sealable, um, I mean, air type thing. And it peels off and you can see it's like it's, it looks like it's silicone. Yeah. And in there I have 16 Windsor and Newton colors. Oh. That is next level. That is really and really and, cool. and so I, I do have some I do have some I do have black and I have the the white that came with the uh, Windsor and Newton set was zinc white, but for years I've also had a tube of uh, the permanent white designer gouache, uh, which is like super white, yeah. and uh, sometimes you can use that, and I I can just carry that one. I usually do carry that tube with my watercolors. But when this goes on there, you can see that it's got the indentations yep. and it, it fits yep. exactly yep. in there. And then you got to squish it everywhere to make sure that you've sealed each one of those. And every once in a while, um, my girlfriend who uses one of these, she takes this one out when she's nature journaling out and about. Um, she's I'm not able to trek through the woods anymore, but she sure is. And I invited her over to give me all the hot tips on gouache. But then I was a little um, apprehensive of trying and something new. I mean, I paint with acrylics. I don't know why I was, you know, apprehensive, but I finally dove in. That cricket was the first thing I've painted with my paints. Mm. So, you know, it was a, it was a great, um, a great beginning and I'm really excited, but I, you know, I, I, this is just so practical. It's got the 16 and she said every once in a while, don't let them dry out. Just take your spritzer and lightly mist everything and um, it'll keep for it forever. So, I mean, she's constantly using hers. So I'm, I'm hoping to use mine, um, you know, more as time goes on now that now that i finally got them it was it took some doing <laughs> yeah, and that's what's nice about your system is there that you're gonna be able to um it bothers me to kind of get my paint out and then any paint that i don't use just dries and gets wasted well um, in this so your system, and it, what, yeah, what, what is the name of that um palette is there a little brand there's one? no name on it oh Nothing. the rascals nothing but I mean there, there it is you know yeah. and when and it's got a little notch in here so that this hinge fits in the notch and then you squish it down um I I, I imagine that if you it's kind of fussy there it goes um and then there's another this we got a double hinge this one locks it in to the bottom this one is the one that opens it up and it's got a couple of little dents so you can rest a brush across cool. your water dish if you like. But, it, you know, you're just going to have to. I actually went to um, Opus Framing and Art Supplies in Vancouver. And right. I couldn't find it on their web page. And uh, it was, uh, what would they call it? They called it uh, like with a brush washer. Brush washer. That's yeah, you know, and it was just like um, that didn't that a palette with a brush washer. Um, and the, I, I wouldn't have found it that way. And I don't know that that's how they call it. But there's no brand name anywhere on this, not even on the bottom. No, nothing. Well, if anybody does find this, please share it with the group in, in a future meeting and uh, maybe share it up on the Facebook page. I think uh, that system would be really good. If you are doing a bunch of stuff just where all your paint is gouache, um, one of the most uh, inspirational gouache artists 
out there. Um, are you familiar with James Gurney? Um, no. So if um, anybody out there has the Dinotopia books, um, the uh, I'm putting a little link in. James, the... James, James Gurney, is he the one with the Gurney palette, the Gurney? Um... Um, he has a website that I just put Easel. Um, he, I, I don't know if he has a, 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 a Yeah, brand. it's a great book. Easel or, or not. Um, but um, he painted all the Dinotopia books. He also says, I'm gonna pull a book off my shelf. Um, well, the, the, the woman that was, um, did the um, birds, I've forgotten her name, on the Wild Wonder Conference, she had a different kind of sealable palette too. And, and uh, cause she puts her paint in the sectional palette and uh, she just squishes her tubes in there and then it airtight, it's sealed every once in a while. She says she missed it over because I rewatched her. Um, I went back in and rewatched um, the workshop that she did during the Wild Wonder International yeah. Conference. Well, <clears throat> great. Um, I'm going to also bring Jack uh, back on here. Okay. Uh, hey, hey uh, Jack, let's hold up our books. It's a good one, right? Um, so, so this is the the book by James Gurney, um, and his videos online are 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 terrific. Um, and uh, so he does a ton of teaching about how he draws, and his favorite medium seems to be gouache. There's tons of stuff with gouache. And, and, and what's his first name? How do you spell it? James, his name. Uh, G U R N E Y. It's in the and, chat. Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks. Um, thank you. And uh, we put also put his uh, uh, blog on the chat. And there you can link to a bunch of the videos that he's made, where he just sort of plops down somewhere and just starts painting away with his gouache. And then you go like, wow, where are you going with this? And you go like, oh, wow. And this, these just, you know, he sees color and he sees light. If somebody can le make, legitimately sort of make a book called Color and Light, it's James Gurney. The guy um, is... Um, both from imagination and from sitting on a spot drawing what he sees, it rocks. Um, and tons of gouache stuff that you can check out. So um, I want to point you in that direction if you're doing a lot more gouache work. Thank you. I go, I'll check it out. I'll Thank probably you. get it. <laughs> Great. Um, I am going to bring on uh, Ray Bonto. Um, hey there. Good to see you. Okay, so uh, it might have got a bit wonky for some reason, but. <laughs> oh, great. Um, yep, and just sort of, you know, playing with this medium, getting more comfort with it. Um, it, what I find is a lot of the control over it is sort of the, the thickness of the paint. And when my paint gets too thick, um, it starts kind of making weird, thicker marks. And, uh, but it's going to, but just sort of being able to, to, to play with that, you're going to be able to make all sorts of, um, uh, on your toned paper, you're going to have have a ball. You you already are doing stuff with gouache, aren't you? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Let's go. Ah. Great. I've messed up my gouache in the palette, and I find it's much more effective if I use it straight from the tube. So. Right. So you've got the the big tube there. That's good. Hundred ml. <laughs> yep, and the uh, and uh, but I do find when I don't have that, just having a little bit of dried gouache hiding somewhere on my palette, um, there'll be times that I'm just really glad that I've 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 got that. Um, you know, just as as one more um, kind of gouache example. Oh, actually, uh, Ray Bonto, did you have some other sketch pages that you wanted to share? Yeah. 
Uh, oh, well, let me I'll bring you back on. Hold on. You a can, you can yeah, uh, watch things first. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll do this little gouache demo and then we'll bring Ray Banto back on, Ray Banto back on for a little share here. Um, I am going to my share screen. Um, there you go. Look, look at that gouache making those brights in there. I mean, that's, that's fun to be able to do that. <clears throat> um, but check this out. Um, just one more kind of shout out to gouache. Um, I don't know, for some reason, a color that I have a really hard time painting and mixing is just sort of this, a, a sort of a sagey green color. Um, so here's oxide of chromium and I can get this diluted and yeah, and it's getting more kind of light ghosty green. But I have often found when I'm out in the field and I'm drawing a little, you know, sagebrush thing for, for me to take um, a little bit of white and mix that with some green, that it just makes this really, this opaque, very, very easy sagebrush green. And for some reason, I just have a hard time mixing this and controlling it when I'm doing it by diluting. And I don't know why, but for a lot of these sort of soft, um, pale sage greens, dropping a little bit of gouache in with the, the, the paint just seems to allow me to hit those colors. Um, and uh, so that's just, that's one of my hacks if I'm drawing sagebrush. Um, now I'm gonna bring in Ray Bonto again. Uh, hello there. Uh, we'd love to see what is happening in your journal. Then we're gonna to jump to Gabriella and then back to Susan. Oh. I have gone crazy about leatherback sea turtles. So I decided to, to sketch one after many attempts. So cool. Oh, isn't that, this is so, this is so exciting. Uh, Melinda, love to have your comments and thoughts about what are you noticing going on here? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I studied leatherback sea turtles with a colleague. I mean, I assist him. And so I was just looking at him and Ray Bonto, from a bio biologist point of view, you've captured so much that makes it, makes it look realistic. I just, I get the feeling of leatherback sea turtle there with your, um, with the attention to detail and putting in that shade underneath to kind of make it, you know, give it that uh, three dimension so it's not completely flat on the ground. And I love the face too, like all the details. Yeah, I can tell you're really learning a lot about turtles just from painting and drawing them. I'm reminded of Jack's workshop with the macaw recently, you know, watching the real thing and noticing all those details gives you more insight onto it. Very oh. cool, I love the big paper. Yes. You need yes. a big paper for a leather back. That's right. You need to do, do a leather back sea journal justice. You need to be able to spread out. And hey, somebody want to point out that you've got going on here that is a really good um, uh, uh, strategy for drawing this. Notice on the back foot, yes. there is a shadow underneath it. Right? Oh, here, 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 here. A video and then on the, um, on the front one, the shadow is on the flipper itself, right? But there is no cast shadow because the back one you're seeing underneath the turtle on the front one that would be coming down and then resting on the sand. So um, might be occluding some of its own shadow. 
blocking you from the view of the shadow. Um, but by punching in those darks on both of those places, it gives this solidity and weight. Just take your finger and cover up the bottom part of this turtle so you're not seeing those dark parts as you look at the screen. Um, and what you can see is that um, it doesn't feel like it has the same weight. Now move your hand, move your hand. And by punching in that dark shadow, you really get the feeling of just the, the massiveness of this. So punching in that really bold shadow there and the way you handle that, the, 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 the oh, is this how big, it, wait, how big it is? Oh man, that's a lot of turtle. That's so cool. And you read great that you're putting more words in your page, Raybanto, as you're learning more about what you're seeing. This is exciting. Yeah, the biggest one I ever found was about, uh, about 2,000, 2,030 pounds. Wow, that's spectacular. That is spectacular. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> it was all the gouache. It was gouache. So lots of gouache going on there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the spots. I went crazy with that. Oh, that's so much fun. That is so much fun. Really dynamic, really exciting. Thank you very much. Ah, Thank you. I'm inspired by that. Uh, Gabriela, it's great to see you. And Hi, who are you? <laughs> you are live. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to share and say thank you for getting me out of my comfort zone. I've never done um, gouache or painted birds before. Um, when I've tried it, it's been a learning experience. Well, hold, that I just birdie up again. hold that birdie up again, please. <clears throat> oh, this is really fun. This is really fun. And I also love... Um, the uh, almost mandala like um, patterning and framing that you're 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 putting with these. That's this is is this is a ton of fun. It was really fun. Thank you. And then after um, last week's class, um, I was laying down in my um, bay window, and we've had um, European hornets. So I was interested in how like the yellows are yellows. So I went ahead and um, did a page on the European Hornets. Oh, this is cool. So uh, hey, everybody check out the sketch note icons here. Like the, the um, exclamation point inside the triangle, the light bulb. Um, also on toned paper using both the white, is that a gel pen that you're writing? It is. Yeah, it is. So gel pen, black pen, and black pen with two different thicknesses just allows us to get this hierarchy of information and makes the page visually easier for us to scan. You also find that when you do this yourself and you're making a page vis visually easier for other people to scan, it makes this information stick in your own brain much better. And I put on um, Ivea's joke as well, right here. <laughs> what, what is the joke? It was the, um, what is brown and sticky? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, and that reminded me, that's actually what made me, when she said that joke, it actually reminded me that the hornets are actually eating my um, lilac tree and they eat the bark on the outside and they just sleep, they eat the, well, they remove the bark and they eat the sap of the tree. So hopefully my tree will survive, but um, uh, that's what reminded me of the hornets and inspired me to uh, to this page. Oh, that's cool. And I like the little uh, magnifier inset there where you have, you're showing the bark chewed, the detail of the bark chewed, and then that little inset box. Yeah. That's really fun. So thank, thank you for Thank you for teaching me that uh, new skill. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing that. That's exciting to see. Um, I'm now going to uh, bring back in Susan. You had something else you wanted to share. Just a little postscript note. 
I one of the videos that I watched on uh, gouache uh, said from tea to butter. And if you're not using your watercolor, you, know, you would water down your gouache paints to a uh, tea consistency. And then you thicken the next layer, a coffee consistency, the next layer, milk, the next layer, cream, and the final layer, butter, where you would use it straight out of the tube. And not to confuse that and use it really thick at the beginning and then try painting over top of it. That's great advice. Um, similarly, that if you're doing the watercolor as transparent at the start, you're going to be kind of following that same progression with the yeah that that would be your tea level or yeah. and maybe and maybe coffee, but then you with the gouache you would get progressively thicker, not thick and then thin on top of it because it wouldn't work as well. Okay, start with you tea. go from tea tea to butter. Tea, coffee, milk, cream, butter. Oh, okay, that's great. That, that's useful. I like that, that framing. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so um, let's, uh, Megan Robinson, um, let's see what's happening in your journal. Hi there. Hello, hello. Let me unmute myself. There. Um, oh, I was watching the bluebirds in my backyard when this weird creature flew by and I had never seen this before but it's a common thing that the cardinals lose their head feathers at the end of August and gr grow new ones again so they look beautiful again in the spring and and this is what he looked like a weird animal <laughs> Wow. And I had never seen that. Oh, that is fascinating. That. But he looked like a, a vulture and had this black head on top of his, his body. And how interesting that they have black skin. Yeah. Who oh, knew? And not me. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that, um, like, uh, I've, I've heard of roadrunners having black skin. And they will, to, to warm themselves in the morning, they will turn and fluff their feathers out, turn towards the sun and uh, expose the black skin at the base of their feathers. But I didn't know that cardinals have that. I wonder if there is some function going on with that. That's really strange. It's just a regular molt. Wow. And they don't all do it at the same time. And they don't do their whole body at the same time, but they do their head. Although there seems to be a theory that it's mites too, but that that's not the preferred theory. It might be. Mm -hmm. It might be mites. Oh, oh, that's really fun. And the skipper that you drew. Look at this. Those are both um, colored pencil, but the Butterfly bush is watercolor. Oh, that's really fun. That's really interesting. The um, so the skippers, they're they're this fast flying um, group of um, butterflies, and they they don't quite fold their wings the way that others do, um, and they've got slightly different shapes on their antenna. Notice the sort of the tips of those antenna yeah. on this butterfly have these. Um, kind of strange little angled pieces down at the end. Um, so skippers, they've got different shapes on the tips of their antenna. Um, it is, uh, but this, um, I love the intensity of these colors and really getting the sense of the, the different texture on the wings, the body, and those flowers. Great, thank you. Thank you, that's really cool. Um, Mary, thank you for being with us. Let me jump over to you and see what's happening. Oh, soft and fuzzy. This is, um, yeah, okay. Um, 
there. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. This is um, a little bit of gouache. This I did on my own. A little bit of gouache and then colored pencil over. But I didn't cover everything. And there's some of the gray paper and I don't know. I just wanted to make this animal look um, uh, very gentle. I think I, I don't know if I'm going to give, maybe I'll just give him a little bit of a shadow on the ground. I'm not sure. I'm, I might um, do it for my grandson. I might give it to him. I don't know. We'll see. But I think, I think the animal, I feel, I feel he's done. I didn't want to overwork it. I tend to overwork things. So I wanted to avoid that. But this sort of has a very peaceful feeling to it. Yeah, I got inspired. This is way back when we went to the wolf um, per, in, in upstate New York, I think it was, the, where they had yeah. the wolves. And I got inspired by that little wolf that was sleeping on the ground. So anyway, so yeah, so I'm going um, to I'm going to pursue this gouache on um, at least with a limited palette on the colored paper and limited palette saves you money. You don't have to buy too many colors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, this was fun. I just wanted to uh, the colored pencil. Um, because I find if I get too much watercolor uh, gouache going on with this paper, it starts to buckle. And, you know, doing an underpainting, let it dry, and then go on to colored pencil. That, that gives you, uh, at least for me, a beginner, it gives me a little more control. Yeah. And, and that's a, a, a system used by many scientific illustrators. They'll do mm -hmm. a gouache underpainting. Um, and then let that dry completely and then work the rest of the detail and colored pencil on top of it. You get the right. saturated color through the gouache mm -hmm. and um, then you get uh, the, the details out of your watercolor. Right, and then, the, and then the white cancels out the gray of the paper so you get the highlights that way and that, it helps a lot. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Okay, thanks so much for the lesson. It was great. Mary, thank you so much for sharing this. Really no great. No problem. To no problem. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Um, so, if anybody else would like to share something with the community at this point, I invite you to do so. Otherwise, in a moment, I will be turning off the camera. And um, anybody who would like to share then. Um, you all have an opportunity to do so. Um, before we um, go, just a couple of uh, closing thoughts. Um, so first of all, remember that these skills that we've been looking at today, they're skills that you de develop just by doing it. So we don't actually, our brains don't really learn very well by watching a YouTube video or even participating in a class. But the more you get hands-on and do it, um, that is where your brain is going to start to, 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 to learn. And don't be afraid of making mistakes. The more mistakes you make, the better, uh, the faster you are going to uh, grow. I'll be talking about this in a future um, uh, educator workshop, but there's some, um, there is, there's some fascinating uh, research that has uh, emerged about making mistakes. And it turns out that when a person is doing a task and you make a mistake, there are regions of your brain that light up independent of whether or not you know you made a mistake. And that's totally counterintuitive to me. So literally, your brain is sparking when it makes mistakes. And you don't have to even be aware that you made mistakes to get this effect. That's the thing that the, the, the researchers are trying to find out. Like it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So the process of making mistakes um, may be an integral part of learning itself. Make more mistakes. If you're not, whatever you're doing, if you are not making mistakes, you're staying in the comfort zone. You're staying in the safety zone. I want to encourage you to, you don't have to go like totally crazy. 
but just push yourself outside of your comfort zone enough that you start getting these mistakes because it's in those mistakes and the struggle that's in there that you're going to be really pushing your brain to grow. So if you're just staying where it's safe and comfortable, you're not going to get all those neural benefits. Um, you absolutely can do this. And the more you do it, the faster you're going to develop it. Um, if it is possible to make a donation to support me in this work, my family and I greatly appreciate that. And you can do that at my website, which is johnmuirlaws.com. If that doesn't work for you and your finances at this time, I want you to encourage you and welcome, let you know that you are welcome to participate in this all the time. This is, is, is free for you. Um, but see if there's another way in your community that you can pay it forward in a different way, without money, just through an act of stewardship or kindness that's going to make our world better. We really need that. Um, we are a, a world increasingly starved for beauty and for kindness. And we make a real difference to others um, and ourselves and our community um, by, 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 by doing so. Um, the act of, of going out and doing something kind changes who you are, I believe, for the better. And want to um, invite you today to um, go out and, uh, and, and get some kindness on you. And just sort of have that idea in the back of your head and see if you can push your kindness to get you to, uh, to do an act of kindness that you otherwise might not do. See what that's like just to sort of to, 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 to play with that today. I want to encourage you to, 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 to play with just noticing how that changes the way that you feel. And if you like it, you might do it again. So until next time, my dear friends, um, thank you all for being here. And I uh, look forward to um, upcoming workshops. Remember, there's lots of things going on in this really vibrant community. You're invited to participate in all of it where possible. Please support the uh, contact, content developers who are uh, making resources uh, for all of us. Um, <clears throat> we, um, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, behind the scenes work that often goes into creating a good program. And um, the more that we can support uh, those people in our community who are doing that, I think that that's a really good thing to do. Thank you all, and I will see you soon.